Today's video is brought to you by Audible. Audible provides a great service for members that I personally use and why I highly recommend it. It's also one of the best ways to make huge savings on Warhammer audiobooks. Now due to a variety of factors I put the book club on hold back in May, but I'll soon be doing a breakdown of my short choice from back then, First Lord of the Imperium, featuring Malkador the Sigilite and this may well be blended into a new Emperor video. I'll also be discussing my next selection at the end of this video, although I plan on shaking the format up a bit for the remainder of the year as we'll be listening to a trilogy, so stay tuned at the end to find out which one. As an Audible member, you get one credit every month for any title across that entire premium selection. Premium members get a 30% discount on purchasing audiobooks generally, and this is my preferred option for the shorter stories. You can start listening today with a free 30-day Audible trial and get full access to thousands and thousands of audiobooks, originals and podcasts, including the entire Plus catalogue. A great many of you in my audience use Audible already, but if you're new to the service, visit audible.com slash Lutin, or for those in the US, text Lutin to 500-500. Full details of my upcoming selections follow at the end of this video. So, to my astonishment, it has been some six months now since we last explored the insanity of weaponry in the 41st millennium. The nightmarish conditions perpetuated often by humanity itself necessitate an arms race that has peaked at weapons capable of scouring entire planets or liquefying individuals from the inside out. All the while, more discreet tools of elimination or designs of one's enemy quite literally burrow themselves insidiously into the bowels of society before breaking out and consuming entire sectors in foul heresy. As I've often noted, it is through these processes of societal destabilization which seemingly result in far more devastating consequences than any individual conflict or, for that matter, struggles over singular worlds. But none of that today. I'm keeping the philosophy shut and we're looking at cold, brutal hardware, for the most part. But to begin, a very brief aside, just a note to say I continue to appreciate all of your support here on the channel with every like and comment on videos, you repeat watchers, people using the videos as sleep aids, and all who contribute good suggestions for new episodes, weapon discussions and their devastating means of annihilation, and I endeavour of course to share my thoughts and wider attachments within that framing. So it's thanks to all of you, as I've often said, every interaction helps the channel, and as always, the better a video does, the more I'll make. So let's once again talk weapons. If your favourite selection of insane weaponry or planetary crushing devices is not featured in this episode, we inevitably continue onward. So do tell me what you want to see next time and why below, but for now we continue our journey of consideration towards the insane and outlandish tools of destruction in the 41st millennium. So to begin with, it seemed a decent idea to continue on with another example of the relic tools of the Imperium but which were created in the later period of the Heresy. Now, in keeping with this series, Leviathan Dreadnoughts are standard Dreadnoughts if you like, but essentially they're turned up to 11. More resilient armour, more powerful weapons. And as I noted in the video discussing Relic Terminators, these were steadily evolving during the Crusade, and the same could be said for Space Marine Dreadnoughts. Dreadnoughts were conceptualised as a way to preserve and maintain some of the greatest Astartes warriors who had fallen in battle but remained alive, just having suffered injuries to such an extreme they would be certain to die otherwise. The solution was to inter them within a Dreadnought sarcophagus, essentially an armoured coffin providing advanced life support systems that would artificially preserve an Astartes life. These sarcophagi would then be placed within the exo-frame of a dreadnought, a hulking bipedal war machine of truly devastating power, armed with generally multiple heavy weapon systems, thus enabling the greatest warriors of the Emperor to continue on fighting beyond what would have otherwise been their death, because only in death does duty end. 
Dreadnoughts are not necessarily a common sight on a battlefield, because like most chapter relics they are held securely within an Astartes chapter fortress monastery or whatever their equivalent is, i.e. a fleet born force. Dreadnoughts are also generally kept in an ongoing period of stasis, and that is to say suspended animation. They're only woken from their sleep when threats facing the Imperium at the most severe, and this presents the strange and jarring situation of a Dreadnought being awoken potentially millennia after their last engagement, and to find their chapter having changed significantly, or at least those they may have been familiar with and fought alongside now have disappeared. Similarly, it can be strange and enlightening for new Astartes, or even say Primaris, to find themselves conversing with an ancient marine who perhaps walked alongside the Emperor in the earliest days of the Imperium and Crusade. The specifically exact origin of Dreadnoughts is generally unknown, although it is suggested that like so many things predictably they came out of the Dark Age of Technology, or at least the initial tech required. It's not exactly surprising for that to be the case since you could arguably say that about most human tech post Age of Strife. Dreadnoughts were reportedly able to be controlled by non Astartes around the turn of the Age of Strife and Unification Wars, but once the Crusade began the focus was on Astartes and of course they benefited from the neural interface plugs throughout their bodies, enabling them to more directly connect with their armoured suits to move them around more intuitively. The ancient proto-dreadnoughts of eras past were likely more akin to an exosuit of sorts, perhaps for warriors who had similarly suffered terrible injuries and maybe used some kind of experimental mind impulse devices like that of later dreadnoughts and knights, or perhaps it was far more basic and literally controlled physically as you might see with a more basic exosuit for loading of equipment, industry, that sort of thing. Either way, as soon as the focus was on dreadnoughts for the Astartes, they were quickly developed to maximise the balance of survival and lethality, although again similarly to Terminator armour, constraints were placed around what could have been a superlative development as a result of the heresy. When it comes to dreadnoughts, it's important to remember the difference between a dreadnought pattern and a variant. A pattern is the specific model of a dreadnought, and these can vary wildly in terms of their power, size, most significant usually are their visual differences. A variant of a dreadnought though tends to be primarily their loadout, and this may be specific to the marine interred. This is the weapons they're armed with, and although it can have other specialised details applied, the goal is to designate specific tools for an Astartes and their dreadnought to be most effective in whatever situation they're being deployed to. Other examples may be librarian dreadnoughts, chaplain dreadnoughts, obviously optimised for their psycho abilities, or whatever needs the Astartes entombed within requires. There are a huge amount of variations, and I'll look to discuss some of that later. But before we get to the Deviathans, I'll just run through the patterns of Dreadnought in brief. Now the most common and recognisable is the Castiferum Dreadnought. This is what you'll see throughout the Imperium in M41, and this is the very well known Boxy Tank Dreadnought. It has several different versions of pattern, and these are equivalent to the altering Mark advancements of Space Marine armour. Some of these can be known as Venerable Dreadnoughts, but they're essentially still the Castiferum pattern, but just visually a little different. They are also known to be less reliable than modern Castiferum Dreadnoughts, and likely this is due to their extended age, and so for Space Marine chapters they require significant maintenance and resources. But Dreadnoughts can still be constructed in the modern 41st millennium of the Imperium, but as with tech like the Volkite it's difficult and only able to be carried out by a few specific individuals on Forge Worlds. We then have the considerably rare Contemptor and Dorido Dreadnoughts. Both of these are examples of advanced Dreadnoughts originating from the Heresy itself, both were more powerful and functionally advanced comparative to the more standard Castiferum. But these patterns are still highly advanced even in the 41st millennium and are extremely prized by any chapters who still maintain them. It's believed these dreadnoughts are no longer capable of being constructed due to their advanced systems such as their energy shielding. For the Dorido this was their Atomantic Pervase energy shield and the Contemptor's Atomantic Field Generator. These are almost mythical pieces of tech now, barely if at all understood. The Contemptor was a more standard battle line dreadnought fitted with an array of weaponry, whereas the Dorido fulfilled a role of heavy weapon support fire. The two patterns share much in common, but each optimised for their specific battlefield role. The Contemptor being more mobile and wielding closer quarter weaponry, the Dorido focused on stability and holding a power plant capable of driving devastating weapons like Volkite and autocannon batteries and the terrifying plasma cannonade. It was also able to be mounted with several options of long range missile ordnance. And while all of these patterns were impressive in their own right, they were all lesser to the ultimate technological dreadnought development, Leviathan Dreadnoughts. 
Leviathans were especially unusual compared to other dreadnoughts, as they were designed and created not on the home planet of the Mechanicus, then still the Mechanicum, or one of its forge worlds, but on Terra itself. Within the Mechanicum, the development of such a piece of technology outside the realm of their control was unsurprisingly not received well. In fact, the Mechanicum believed that the Leviathan Dreadnoughts were being designed specifically with the potential to overpower their wetware robots at some unknown future juncture. And given the Emperor's penchant for maintaining absolute control over his plans at any cost, this seems like a conflict that would have inevitably happened along the way were it not for the heresy. The Leviathan Dreadnought itself was an adapted upgrade of the Contempt of Dreadnoughts, essentially scaled up and overpowered. It's rumoured, and given its origin of terror, that the Emperor was involved directly with its design. This seems considerably plausible. However, because of its size and extremely advanced technology, it's said that the construction of a single Leviathan can be equivalent to an Imperial Knight, and even before the Heresy, this pattern was only available in very limited numbers. Dreadnoughts in general, as powerful as they are, with their heavy armour and massive firepower, are weakened most by their pilots. Space Marines interred within a Dreadnought have often suffered catastrophic injuries, and maybe no more than a torso and head floating around in a fluid suspended sarcophagus meshed with neural sensory fibre bundles that allow them to control these heavy walkers. This abrupt change in sense and lifestyle though can be extremely difficult even for a space marine. Many have trouble adapting to their newly confined lives and it's even been reported that among some chapters they have actively resisted the possibility of being placed within a dreadnought. For there are some who see it as something akin to an intolerable life sentence of a punishment. If serving as a space marine is seen as a massive sacrifice in terms of the loss of one's humanity, personal relationships, family, to a degree, empathy, then becoming a dreadnought is the doubling down of this in service to the Emperor. Marines placed in dreadnoughts will literally only know war from here on and little else. They will fight only in battle after battle, never sharing the wit and contemplations of regular Astartes. Their only opportunities to converse with others may be in the brief periods of repair and maintenance with their Tech Marine brothers and Mechanicus priests, or the short period of briefing and pre-deployment into an active battle zone. All of these challenges can be extremely mentally taxing, and some Marines will endure this change better than others, but for others it can lead to them becoming extremely unstable. Sometimes this can be tempered by allowing them to serve within a section of their chapter most befitting their former fighting style, and often their dreadnought will then be equipped with weaponry that most suited their former lives, thereby helping reduce the stress on the occupant. Within a Leviathan dreadnought, the sheer power and stresses on both the machinery and the pilot were considerably greater than that of lesser dreadnoughts, and this led to a much higher degree of pilot burnout, burning twice as bright, but half as long, you might want to quote. In the aftermath of the heresy, the already rare leviathans were almost unheard of to be maintained by traitor legions, although it's very possible some still exist. The loyalists had continued access to terror, and so were able to secure the new sliver of leviathan dreadnoughts being able to be produced. And for those which were created, they were truly awesome in their power. Towering over other dreadnoughts and war machines on the battlefield, their size is something that has to be seen to be believed, and their arsenal of weaponry is formidable, with some being used exclusively by the Leviathan. Where the Contempted Dreadnoughts use atomantic shielding, the Leviathans use a more powerful reinforced atomic barrier. Both of these shielding types can result in a powerful shockwave should one of these massive war machines fall in battle. The Leviathan is always believed to have been primarily used for siege assaults, hence its massive defensive capability coupled with heavy firepower. It's sacrificing movement of course for having to carry such a heavy load, although despite this it's still relatively fast moving considering its huge bulk. Leviathans will either use a siege claw or drill as a melee tool, both being quite horrific as it is essentially an oversized advanced version of a power claw, something rarely seen in Astartes post heresy. The alternative siege drill is pretty self-explanatory, featuring three large cutting heads, it can chew through armour and rockcrete comfortably, anything of flesh matter barely is worthy of consideration, as they'll be chewed and torn to pieces by the huge rotating cutting tools, twisting their enemies apart. Beyond these melee options, leviathans usually are mounted with three hunter-killer missiles for targeting enemy armour at extreme range. They can then be also fitted with any combination of three arm-mounted weapons, the Grav Flux Bombard, Cyclonic Melter Lance and Storm Cannon Array. These can be paired or fitted individually. They're likely weapons you've not heard of before, simply for the fact they're exclusively used by leviathan dreadnoughts. 
But I must though preface the descriptions of these weapons with a frustrating reality check, so to speak. Sometimes, but not often, the tabletop game and the lore converge, and this usually occurs when something like the weapons of the Leviathan have a little background material describing their functionality or history. So instead, you end up having to rationalise and place their power on a scale of their effectiveness in comparison within the tabletop itself. And the reason why I feel it's fine to ignore this is because, as I've often said, at best things are incredibly vague within the verse of 40k, and one account may not support another. Beyond that, the tabletop game very regularly bears little resemblance to the scale or power of weapons and units within the law itself, because if it were to do so, some fights would be just ridiculous and any sense of balancing would be even less of a thing than it is already. Anyway, my point is, when all you have to go on are basically stats, it's probably more interesting to default to the option of choice. And what I mean by that is that specifically between the 8th and 9th editions of Warhammer 40,000, Leviathan Dreadnought weapons received something of a nerf, mainly the Storm Cannon Array, which even had its name nerfed and is now just called the Storm Cannon, which kind of sucks. Now what I'll do is blend the two changes together and you can decide for yourself which is the more awesome version. It should be pretty clear, by the way. Now the Storm Cannon Array is and was a truly insane weapon. Its firepower is essentially comparable to a Primaris Suppressor's Accelerator Autocannon, except instead of one, each array is made of four barrels combined, quadrupling the fire rate of what is in the modern era a fairly slow firing weapon used only by Primaris. And to be absolutely clear, the Leviathan Storm Cannon is not the same weapon. It's just in terms that of its damage, the Accelerator is the most comparable modern equivalent. It also operates at half the range of the Accelerator Autocannon. So then, imagine if your Leviathan Dreadnought were to wield two of these horrifying quad storm cannons, and they are now truly living up to their name as unleashing a devastating storm of firepower upon their enemies. Or at least, they were, because now, according to stats, let's say in fiction most recent reports, the Storm Cannon is only comparable to, say, a twin Iron Hail autocannon, which to me seems a little sad when you consider that the Storm Cannon is far bigger, has four barrels, and is a weapon from a glorious period in the Imperium's history just prior to the Heresy, almost a Imperium technological zenith, and potentially even worked on by the Emperor. But yes, it's supposedly now comparable to a weapon wielded by the legendary Primaris Baby Cradle, which for me just leaves something of a sour taste. Anyway, that's my bitter resentment aside, it's why law and tabletop are rarely friends, the two things do not often align well. But then happily we come to the Cyclonic Melter Lance, which thankfully escaped more unscathed. By the look of the thing, it should already give you some horrifying ideas of just what it's capable of, as this thing is the epitome of the Imperium's tech, in the sense that they took a powerful thing and just scaled it up. Basically a multi-melter, but times three which as you can imagine can lead to some truly apocalyptic results. Let me frame it for you this way. If it were able to focus the firepower well enough and dealt critical damage with all of its beams, it could near enough destroy anything on the battlefield. Imperial Knight, an Astraeus tank, Orc Warbosses, Demon Princes of Chaos, the firepower of the Cyclonic Melter is truly insane. And that's just one of them. I'd remind again, you could potentially arm a Leviathan with two of these for a more refined and elevated face melting experience. And then we come to the Grav Flux Bombard. Now the word Grav is probably giving away the fact that like this Cyclonic Melter, this is a scaled up version of other Grav weapons. Well, you would in fact be absolutely right, because the Imperium is nothing if not predictable. What did you think, that they were just going to invent a new weapon? That's dangerous thinking my friend, you best stick to your work. Or the supervisor will be sending you off to become corpse starch cubes. The Grav Flux Bombard is then yes, a scaled up version of other Grav weapons used by the Imperium. Saying that though is no small thing, grav weapons are some of the most truly horrifying, both at the individual level or for those used by the Mechanicus Servitors as I've discussed before, the grav flux will send out a spinning vortex of grav torsion forces, twisting and crushing its enemies under unfathomable forces into unimaginable shapes. As with all grav weapons, the nature of them means armour is effectively useless, and no matter were they to be a humble flak armoured human, a chaos terminator, even a primaris marine, all would be crushed to a pulp in an instant by the focus gravitic beam that would distort then crush the matter of their bodies in a display of mind-bending horror. Seeing human forms condensed often together in a bizarre floating sphere of gravitic energy is something few can witness and not break from. The most interesting thing about grav weapons though is, or I should say was, how their power can scale. 
So unlike many other weapons, when facing a larger target, the Grav Flux will potentially deal a scalable level of damage. And to give an idea of its firepower, if a shot from the Grav weapon was on target, it could potentially kill 75% of a Primaris squad in one hit with little trouble. And this feature used to be even more powerful in the previous iteration. But overall, it remains a powerful weapon, just not as terrifying as it once was. But this scalable feature remains the true power of the Grav Flux. Even now, its manipulation of forces make it a truly fear-inducing weapon to overcome, and this in combination with the Leviathan powering it places it well above most other Grav weapons. And anything that can still kill 75% of a 10-man Primaris squad in one go is quite the weapon, and not something you'd really want to face on a battlefield. Then, on top of all of this, the Leviathan then wields two hull-mounted either Heavy Flamers or Volkite Calivers. And one thing Leviathans are not short of are weapon options. And for me, quite honestly, despite their recent, let's call it, realignments, they still have a special place for me as the ultimate battlefield dreadnought in both looks and firepower. Wherever one may be found now, Leviathans are some of the most cherished and venerated chapter relics for the Astartes, awesome machines of a darkened age who entirely live up to their name both in scale and power. Some even refer to them as relics of darkness, for they're so rarely seen as to be near mythical, and when one does stride out across the battlefields of the 41st millennium, it can only be authorised by an Astartes chapter master. This is in part due, of course, to their prestige and rarity, but it is also due to the fact that many of the marines who currently rest within a Leviathan Dreadnought are racked with both the pain and demands of the machine, and this is only then exacerbated by the memories of the machine itself. For much like knights, Leviathan's machine spirits are believed to be powerful, and their machine memories are stained with the blood-soaked horrors from the Age of Darkness. And this suffering can sometimes override an Astartes within the Dreadnought, leading them to become something of a walking lucid dream upon a battlefield. In the worst instances, perhaps not able to tell even friend from foe, or fighting imaginary horrors from millennia past. So the unleashing of a Leviathan can be something of a double-edged sword, and certainly not to be undertaken lightly, for the consequences could be potentially far worse than the benefits gained, and so the ultimate responsibility for deploying a Leviathan must always remain with the chapter master. Within the realms of the unimaginably horrifying weaponry deployed in the 41st millennium, it's somewhat surprising that the bespoke weaponry of the Emperor's children has not featured previously in discussing truly bonkers weapons, because it absolutely sits up there alongside oddities like the Harlequin's Kiss as some of the most foul weaponry existing in the dark future. The Horus Heresy split humanity. The traitors who turned against the Emperor did not all do so from the outset, understanding the true gravity of their decision, while others knew full well the path they had started down. There were not an initially significant number of Marines who would begin exhibiting visual signs of bizarre corruption during the early period of the Heresy. Most Astartes who had turned away from the Emperor still appeared visually no different than they had done previously, save for perhaps some defacing their armour, and similarly their weaponry remained that which was generally available to all Astartes of the time. It would only be in the latter days and post-heresy itself when we begin to see the true extent of the severe mutations, deviations and physical alterations of the Marines who had embraced darkness and allowed themselves to become so fully corrupted by chaos. Among those were of course the Third Legion, the Emperor's Children, whose Primarch Fulgrim would align with the god Slanesh, the Chaos God which embodies lust, desires, greed, decadent excesses, the exploration in the limits of pleasure, pain and experience, the unrelenting pursuit of perfection, and just generally the satisfaction of one's own pleasures, no matter how extreme without consideration of the morality or cost to others. The Astartes of the Third Legion began to carry strange, unsanctioned experimental psychosonic weapons just prior to the outbreak of total heresy. At this time many legions were already contaminated and unusual behaviour being seen more openly, but this section of marines within the legion would become known as the Cacophony. They used savagely powerful sound-based weapons, but the initial iteration's origins were unknown and also dangerously unpredictable. The emergence of these sound weapons is believed to have been based around one of Fulgrim's most famed remembrances, Kinska, who had become wildly twisted. Some of her last remaining pleasures in life are said to have been seducing and twisting the views of others, but as a composer she also sought the perfection of her art and seemingly at any cost, which aligns very much with the realm offered by Slanesh. 
Kinska would create a bizarre symphonic experience which during its first and only performance ultimately resulted in her death and a bizarrely horrifying exhibition of sex and violence. But it would be the sonic effects of the symphony in how they drove insane, tormented and generally inflicted terrible physical harm which had piqued the interest of several attending Emperor's children. This was believed to have been the key origin and trigger point in the further development of their sonic weaponry. The prototypes used in the symphony would ultimately become the most commonly seen iterations, the Sonic Blaster, Blastmaster and Doom Siren. In M41, the name Emperor's Children seems a heretical slur few would wish to utter. The designation of Noise Marines is good enough, and they are surreal, terrifying beings. Like all followers of Sonash, they will have lost all perspective of sensation, and much like the Dark Eldar who created the god they refer to as She Who Thirsts, Human followers also start down a path of sensation and self-gratification that becomes eventually torturously unachievable. Their singular focus now is upon satisfying their extreme desires and these are truly beyond mortal comprehension. In many ways, the transformative nature of Slanesh and Nurgle are likely what makes them the most horrifying of the Chaos Gods in the minds of human mortals. Like many worshippers of the Chaos Gods, those who dedicate themselves fully and who demonstrate a worthwhile service to their masters may be bestowed upon with gifts. For the Noise Marines, one of their gifts from Slanesh is to possess an unnaturally extended range of hearing. It may be fair to say that their level of auditory sensation enables them to almost see sound and reach an entirely different plane of understanding within the subtlety of the cacophony of war and all the sounds which encompass this. The roar of battle, the din of gunfire, the screaming misery of suffering. Unsurprisingly paired with their already twisted outlook, this heightened level of sensory perception has caused them to feel a broad range of experience with all sounds they encounter, from the purest distillation of what could be described as pleasure to unbearable agony. To humans, this sounds, of course, nightmarish. But much like the followers of Nurgle in how they delight in the rot and decay, the fecundity of such observations that we might choose to describe as horrifying suffering, they see as beautiful. Noise marines revel in the extreme boundaries of sensory experience, deliberately exposing themselves to the loudest or most unusual waveforms possible. The more pure or chaotic, the better, and that would for the ordinary human prove to be almost instantaneously fatal in one way or another, if not by a literal collapse of critical body functions, then some other horrifying process of organ bursting, arteries and veins open throughout the body, bones shattering, or far, far worse things. Think liquefaction, think loss of all control of body systems. All of these sights and sensations, though, would never be enough for a noise marine. They need to immerse themselves within the cacophony of horror and battle as if it were a warm blanket wrapped around them, a tsunami of sound, a deluge of desires. They lose themselves in the overwhelming auditory experience, and this will be when they bring their own sound weapons to bear and begin to add their own individual performance to the battlefield. Where noise marines are seen walking among the war zones of the galaxy in M41, there are a few who live to tell of it and those who do are either too broken to speak of it, or their minds are literally turned to mush. Of course, they are the lucky ones, I mean, obviously. The truly damned individuals will be those who are dragged off for sacrifice to the prince of all pleasure, in some extreme act of perversion to appease Slanesh. I think I've noted before how it would be unwise to allow yourself to be captured alive by the Drakari, while you can also add servants of Slanesh to that list, because truly a Laz or stub pistol to the head is going to be considerably preferable. Surely the Emperor would not hold such an act against you. Or then again, saying this, with what we know of the Emperor, to be honest, you're likely going to be screwed either way. So if you were not being forcibly made to endure some emotional feat of endurance that reached the limits of twisted imaginations by those worshipping Slanesh, you may find yourself being mutilated so as to be fitted with any number of sonic amplifiers and speakers. The nearest comparison would be perhaps something akin to an arco-flagellant, except that in this instance you do not serve penance for acts against the Holy Emperor, you will walk the battlefield in service to your traitor marine masters and the dark gods they serve, that you now serve. These extreme body modifications will very obviously cause the bearer significant suffering, and this is absolutely fine, because by design these wails will become amplified, every tortured cry, garbled, choking moan will be driven to eye-bursting volumes. When these captive human tools of the noise marines are led into battle, 
It's less of a charge and more of a ramshackle staggering gaggle behind their captors, all fastened together by golden hooks and chains. If their agonizing screams are insufficient, then of course it's time to whip out the barbed toxic lashes, so that they might rise together in an unbearable wall of auditory suffering. Such is the effect of this unholy choir, that many a guard regiment will run stumbling and screaming from a battlefield, and if you think such an unending wall of screaming would not have a disturbing effect, then you really need to find time to watch the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. But that's a film which creates a truly harrowing experience, driven largely by sound alone. There's very little visual gore in the film compared to modern day experiences, yet you still come away audibly shocked. Another interesting and I suppose actually rare example of sound being used as a weapon was in the 1986 movie Biggles, and I only make mention of this because it traumatised me as a child. The characters travel through time and end up in a dystopian future where a horrifying sound weapon has been created, and it really is something right out of 40k. In fact, it was actually reviewed in issue 77 of White Dwarf. Overall, it's a pretty terrible film, but becomes something of a cult classic. The weapon itself seemingly destroys matter, and despite this being a PG-rated family film, one character pulls apart a guy's face, which along with this whole sequence, scarred my memories as a kid. I suppose lastly, I should make a mention, of course, to the weaponry in the 1984 Dune movie, so-called weirding modules, which are essentially comparable to how noise marine weapons function, although I'm sure this is merely a coincidence, right? From what I recall, these do not appear in the Dune novels. Noise marine weapons have been developed and refined to a point they can unleash irresistible walls of sound, flattening all in their path, even buildings, or focused enough to tear apart individuals from the inside out. Noise marines are the masters of sound range and can create sustained frequencies enough to shake apart and bring down entire buildings, while charging toward their victims they will unleash powerful blasts of sound that tear through victims as described. These are the most powerful against soft tissues of human targets, organs, bones, flesh, eyeballs, the brain. All can be destroyed under the highly focused extreme levels of sound wave directed toward their suffering victims. And it should go without saying that the least a human guardsman might expect to walk away from an encounter with a noise marine would be permanent hearing damage. Also worth mentioning, not that ammunition is ever really something that seems of a concern in M41, but interestingly, noise marine sonic weapons do not require ammunition, which obviously makes sense, but they do require some sort of power source. Most sonic weapons used by the Emperor's children, specifically those designed for the noise marines of Slanesh, are connected or even fused into the bearer's power armour, drawing directly from the armour's power supply, so as long as the armour has power, the sonic weapon functions. The twisted and corrupt servants of Slanesh that once were called the Emperor's children continue to walk the war zones of the 41st millennium. Many are now barely recognisable as anything one would dare to call a space marine, their mind-shattering melodies emanating from Vox speakers fused into distended jaws, sound amplifying pipework running the course of twisted armour. Noise marines do not simply invoke fear or some range of emotional reaction, they quite literally overwhelm the sensory capacity of their victims, making the experience barely anything one would describe as a conscious choice in the matter. For those targeted by the torturous and disturbing weapons, by the time the sound has reached you, many will be on their knees in writhing agony, a blend of unspeakable suffering yet simultaneously strangely euphoric. Thus their spun web of sound has achieved its goal, trapping those who might otherwise run or fight, initially incapacitating them before deciding their fate with the mere flick of a wrist. Now, not entirely dissimilarly to the Gravflux bombard of the Leviathan Dreadnoughts comes another ancient and terrifying weapon known as conversion beams. Conversion beams are on one level fairly simple, at least on the superficial level, in our observation of the consequences of being hit by such a weapon. A conversion beam weapon very much does what it says on the tin, it literally converts matter into energy. Similarly to grav weapons, the consequences of being attacked by a conversion beam is that armour is of little to no barrier in protecting against such a weapon. Anything touched by the beam of a sea weapon is said to be literally torn apart 
as it implodes at a subatomic level, and be they infantry or heavily armoured vehicles, the result is much the same. Now I mentioned its surface level simplicity. This is perhaps true for a lot of Imperial technology, and in fact somewhat of the Imperium's approach to technology in general. I think we've used any number of analogies before now, a good one being most people might know how to change a car wheel and top up various fluids, but anything more complicated than that is essentially magic. Well, the same is true for most mechanical operatives in the Imperium. People can see superficially how something functions and its impact. They may have an inkling as to how to perform basic maintenance. But beyond that, it's often a mystery, and as that classic Arthur C. Clarke quote goes, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. For the Imperium, this is very much true of conversion beam weapons. Strangely, for the C-beam, there is a direct correlation between the distance to which the beam extends from the weapon itself relevant to its destructive power. Range causes it to become increasingly powerful, which leads into some of the confusion around its functionality. On the one hand, it wouldn't do much good to fire a weapon with such devastating properties if they instantly were manifested. You wouldn't want to, say, convert the weapon itself and presumably cause some overload killing the user. A haphazard friendly misfiring of, say, an Imperial standard LAS cannon could be damaging and problematic. But if a C-beam held its maximum power effectively as it left the weapon, this could be something which you might inadvertently destroy an entire building, an Imperial Knight, even one of the smaller elements of a Titan's appendage. Now more technically, conversion beams use a concentrated stream of antimatter focused to a terminal point, but because of the weapon's size and unstable nature, they must be fired from a unit who remains essentially stationary when operated, or the intensity of the beam will be thus negated. This is considerably limiting downside, but it's offset by the power of the weapon, and this led to it being mounted primarily on units with the size and power to plant themselves firmly, like dreadnoughts and knights, or if available, anti-grav platforms. Now, sea weapons are described as expelling a stream of neutron-bombarded antimatter particles, thereby beginning an atomic chain reaction that converts any matter the antimatter touches into an equivalent mass of energy in a blazing beam that hurtles toward the target. As the escalating antimatter-matter reaction travels, air molecules are converted into a deadly blast that finally consumes the target in an explosive release of pure energy. Now, 40k's for weapon science is often pretty lacking, but essentially, it's probably best to just think of this from the orc point of view. Big beam gets strong on things that are far. And this is usually the amount of thought worthwhile expending on such matters, because all we need to know really is that it's dealing more damage to a target over distance. If it simply converted the target's mass itself into energy, the distance element would seem to be somewhat irrelevant. This thought does somewhat conflict with early descriptions of the greater mass of a target being what amplified the power of the weapon, so it becomes something of a quandary. The more sciencey descriptions are the more recent ones, but I always say most recent does not equal most correct in terms of known information. You need to take the full context into account, and in this instance that basically equates to binaric scrawls of Mechanicus text, perhaps some forgotten archive parchment describing the process by someone who had maybe even no idea what they were even seeing, a beam which consumes its targets by painfully and aggressively converting them into energy seems more intriguing to me than a beam which gathers some quasi-conversion power over distance. Ultimately, I think in this instance it comes down to individual interpretation, because really what we need to be concerned about is the end result. The exact timing of the conversion process is not explicitly detailed. Does it take seconds, fractions of seconds? You'd imagine so, given the descriptions happening at a subatomic level, but it's reported that more agile units may be able to escape the worst of the sea beam so it seemingly requires more than a brief moment to deal damage, and perhaps this is the trade-off for its immense power that and the need to be essentially stationary to fire. Both of these factors make it not always the most practical of requirements amid a galaxy of deadly fast moving enemies. And this does make the conversion beam a less of a weapon to use for engaging with flying targets, speeders or infantry in general. However, for targeting say powerful artillery across a battlefield or heavy units that have been slowed and crippled but are otherwise still operational, this is where conversion beamer can come into its own. A scavenger, perhaps, of sorts. The more dense the matter of the target, the more molecular agitation will occur and ultimately more energy converted, making its process more explosive and more effective. 
Conversion beams for all their power have several fairly major things going against them though. Their lack of mobility is noted for one, coupled with the significant amounts of power to drive them. As such, the larger versions are limited to generally vehicles like the Contemptor Dreadnoughts and Deimos Predator tanks, although surviving examples of these fitted with sea beams are of course considerably rare. Rarer still though are the barely known Mechanicus Acastus Asterius pattern knights. If you were able to find one in existence, it is itself about as irreplaceable as the weapons it wields. Both are relics of ancient technology and the Acastus pattern of knights are outfitted with considerable armour as they're generally designed for standing and firing, not charging across a battlefield. And whether it's the Porphyrion armed with two twin volcano cannons or the Asterius and its two twin conversion beams, each is more than capable of decimating the walls and heavy emplacements of mighty fortresses and obliterating any who stand against them. While conversion beams are generally mounted on these large vehicles, there are very rare examples of them being used by elite individuals such as Tech Marine Masters, Grey Knights and Death Watch, even some Inquisitors. How that works is beyond me. Although most Imperial weapons tech is scalable, as I regularly note, personal handheld iterations of sea weapons are exceedingly rare, almost mythically rare at this point, and accounts of their operation even rarer. Still, much ancient archaea tech exists throughout the galaxy, and undoubtedly if anybody was going to still have access to such weaponry, it would be the Grey Knights Death Watch Inquisitors, and most likely of course Mechanicus. Although, the last known units to wield these were the mysterious Myrmidon Destructors. These were a specific set of tech priests within the Mechanicum pre and during the Heresy, who specialised in the art of destruction with ranged weaponry, and they were very much the embodiment of this through their heavily augmented bodies, which they used to mount powerful weaponry like Volkite culverins and sea beams. They also had access to photon thruster cannons, irradiation engines and graviton imploders, all of which are basically as bad as they sound. And I feel it would be cruel of me not to share the details of the Photon Thruster Cannon, another unusual rarely heard of weapon. These were and remain extremely guarded as to their details within the Mechanicus should any even exist today. They were seen during the Heresy and the Mechanicum were highly restrictive even then in their use among their own ranks. The reason being, they are highly suspected as being of Xenos origin so obviously hardly officially sanctioned. These lance-like weapons when fired unleashed a screaming needle-thin beam of utter blackness so dark it's said to essentially be unlight, a pure void, and this beam can cut through nearly anything, even the densest of materials, slicing through targets like the proverbial hot knife through butter. The power and construction of these weapons is unknown, but are seen to leave pulsating waves of darkness behind, they also remain extremely unstable, and malfunctions have been seen to consume their operators by raging black flames turning all to dust, a nightmare weapon to which we may only speculate as to its origins. For the Myrmidons though, the power of the conversion beam weaponry perfectly aligned with what they sought to be, for they had specifically augmented their bodies to enable them to wield weapons of maximum destructive capability. Reinforced endoskeletons and upgraded power systems, few from this machine god cult appeared even close to a human. They were more like grotesque walking cyborgs with machine skull faces. And while their bodies quite literally lumbering monstrosities, Myrmidons themselves were unequaled in their precise use of such devastating weaponry. Few enemies or fortifications were able to resist their destructive will, and as such they became of increased importance across many Forge Worlds during the Heresy. And speaking of cults, we move on to another brand of fanatical worshippers. So continuing with the musical insanity theme comes a multiple rocket launching tank used by the Sororitas known as the Exorcist. Now it's convenient that I chose a weapon of the Sororitas today as it pairs nicely with my recommend for Audible of the Dark Imperium trilogy encompassing Plague War and Godblight, as one of the core arc themes throughout these books remains the nature and question of Imperial faith and the power of such an undefinable force. The faithful among the most devout citizenry of the Emperor will often be stirred into acts that go far beyond what ordinary humans should be capable of even at the astonishment and disbelief of unbelieving Astartes who have lived lives disconnected from the often flexible imperial creed. Yet the mysteries surrounding devotion to the Emperor remain. It has very often been demonstrated that in specific chosen individuals the Emperor 
most certainly does protect. The Sororitas are absolutely devoted in their beliefs that they serve the Emperor, the one true God of humanity, and that he may speak directly to them. This can even lead to bizarre circumstances where sisters engage in acts that leave they themselves condemned as heretics, but not entirely unlike radical inquisitors, their belief that they serve a greater good is more powerful than any chain of command. This fanatical divine belief that drives all worshippers of the Emperor in the Sororitas, Ecclesiarchy and indeed Guardsmen and Citizenry are powerful forces that should not be underestimated. And it's through weapons like the Exorcist that they deliver holy vengeance against the heretics and simultaneously inspire feats of otherwise impossible sacrifice through organ blasts and rising crescendos of powerful hymnals. An adjacent example might be to imagine the flame-shooting guitarist from Fury Road, but like as a chanting monk playing a huge organ. The Exorcist is really a pure distillation of everything the Sororitas represent. It's a tool of divine inspiration, a platform to blast out symphonic holy waves of inspiring hymns to the servants of the Emperor. It's an armoured mobile shrine to his divinity and a warning to those who consider any belief than what is the most obvious. The Emperor is the one true God and all must unquestionably obey the authority of the Imperial government. Then finally, it delivers direct hellfire upon the enemies of mankind as if the Emperor himself were reaching down out of the sky and purging the Xenos and Heretic from all worlds. The mad constructions of the Ecclesiarchy notwithstanding, it's worth considering the actual applications of such a design. Imagine your Imperial Servant, a broken Sororitas, is left ruined by a devastating first assault of heretics. An Imperial Guard squad actively collapsing under the weight of Xenos horror, or a citizenry mounting a last hopeless defence against rebelling traitors or perhaps invading Chaos Spawn. On the wind, they hear what first they assure is only their imagination, but the organ music, the divine sound of holy prayer and singing rises above the deafening roar of battle. Explosions strike hard into the ground all around, the enemies of humanity are decimated. And then, as if sent forth by the Emperor himself, a force of his holy warriors, striding alongside the vehicle known as the Exorcist. Hearts are set aflame in a blaze of zealous fury, and the beaten down and broken humans become shining vessels for the Emperor's wrath. The missiles fired from the Exorcist missile launcher are armor-piercing explosives that are capable of annihilating enemy tanks or destroying squads of heavy infantry in a single salvo, assuming the launcher of course does not malfunction. While the weapon itself is extremely powerful, for the Sisterhood, its primary purpose is to serve as a divine symbol of the power and glory of the Ecclesiarchy. Entire squadrons of exorcists will be deployed to break the will of the enemies of humanity via armoured long-range spearheads. Enemy advances are reduced to tattered remains as any who survive are overwhelmed and surprised by a head of bolter shells and flame. Raging Sororitas pour over them, displaying no mercy whatsoever. As with most weaponry of the Imperium, it's common for exorcists which originate from the Age of Apostasy to be at best temperamental and at worst outright malfunction. However, for the Sororitas, they are unsurprisingly able to find divine rationalizations for such occurrences, and as with almost any event, it only further entrenches their beliefs. All is proof in the eyes of the sisters of the holy reach of the Emperor of Man. Many Sororitas believe exorcist tanks are capable of becoming so excessively saturated with the Emperor's holy power that the sisters will claim their machine spirits themselves become touched. To such a degree, they sometimes transcend into moments of religious epiphany beyond any mortal understanding. Unfortunately, this also brings the machines themselves to a halt. The mysteries of faith in the Imperium of Mankind remain. It's far too big of a topic to even think of going on a tangent today within one of these videos. So all of that will have to wait for later on, and as noted, a good starting place is the Dark Imperium Trilogy. Now, while it may well be regarded as something of a meme, I shall here attempt to construct a viable description around the famed Shovels of Creek, a weapon which has reached a legendary status not unlike Guardsman Marbo, and similarly to Marbo, there are always kernels of truth within the memery. And for someone who takes things way too seriously, like me, it's always a fun mental gymnastic to try and rationalise these things. 
Now the shovel becoming the Krieg Guardsman's brutal melee weapon of choice has somehow become well entrenched, did you like that one, in the mythology of the 40k verse, but just why is somewhat perplexing. There really is no basis for it other than just the standard lean-in on the Kriegers as the ultimate unenhanced human warriors, both in their physical ability to endure and their unbreakable nihilistic spirit. Now I'm not going to re-examine the Krieg in detail today, as we did that very recently, and if I want to go over it again, it would warrant a much further, deeper, expanded thought piece about their entire existence. But suffice to say, the idea of a Krieg Guardsman battering their enemies like, say, a Chaos Marine into bludgeon submission really sits within the dark comedy that 40k exists as, and as I've discussed before now, although many of the 40k novels like the Heresy series and the more recent things approach the verse of 40k with an ever more grandiose and serious tone, if you're thinking 40k is not a bleak comedy, then you've not been paying attention. Similar to Judge Dredd, it's very much a commentary on what happens when everything turns to absolute hell and the very worst traits of humanity are allowed to just run wild. Within that sense of dark comedy, bludgeoning someone with a trench digging tool fits very much into the parameters. And it's not unlike some of the most well-known shovel kills in other fictional examples, Psycho 2's shovel mum kill, or Day of the Dead's zombie head severance to name but just two examples, there are many more. Shovels have made an appearance in the Battlefield series as a melee weapon as well, and a nice crossover for me inserting Battlefield into a 40k vid there. But the point being, it's simply a joke weapon, because it's a blunt tool not designed primarily for vanquishing one's enemies. Now for the history nerds, yes, we all know by now that during World War I sharpened, well-maintained shovels were apparently used as weapons, and by all accounts more useful sometimes than even bayonets. Now, I'm not extensively read on this, so my cursory Google searches will have to suffice, but feel free to give your detailed breakdowns of this in the comments, I'm sure at least one person will. Other examples exist, of course, and it's undoubtedly due to situations where supplies were limited and things were in a desperate situation, that or just having to wield whatever you had to hand. I think for anyone though who's actually used a well-sharpened shovel for just digging, you soon get an idea of what you could do to soft tissue and it's certainly an unpleasant thought. The dimensions of a trench shovel essentially make it equivalent to an axe. All of this then fits perfectly the mould of a Krieg Guardsman, an unrelenting tool of war themselves who will not submit or surrender under any circumstances. And what are we talking about here? It's really about the absurdity, the juxtaposition of a human guardsman fighting with a shovel against the horrific Xenos enemies of man. I think the meme of the Krieg shovel is far less about the shovel itself and far more about the Krieg. As I said, there's always slivers of truth in humour, and for the Krieg, it's their extremely over-the-top insanity when it comes to wars of attrition that make them ripe for memory. The emotionless, unbreakable human tanks, any enemy will fall against them, even the most powerful Chaos Marines, shovel to the face, digging right through their fallen bodies. The humble shovel has become so much of an embedded tool of the Krieg that it's even included as a specific piece on the newest minis within the Kill Team set and featured in their animated trailer. Where does that leave us? Well, we have chain swords, we have chain axes, chain fists. Perhaps it's time for a chain shovel, anyone? So now let's talk about my next selection for you on Audible. I decided that it would be good to give everybody time to work through a trilogy that I completed relatively recently, and overall the series I'm talking about is the updated Dark Imperium, Plague War and Godblight series. Now there's a whole variety of twists and turns across these three audiobooks, and the story delves into a plethora of topics. There's many different perspectives presented, and a huge amount of discussion to be had. Of course, the Heresy series is one that people always want to gravitate to, but because I really enjoyed this trilogy overall, I think it's a very valuable series also in understanding where things stand right now for humanity and the Imperium in M41. I also thought it would be best to complete this trilogy through the remaining months of this year, and then I'll make an overview of the entire series later along the line, but I'll still be recommending other additional options to listen to in upcoming months. I know so many of you have contributed thoughts to me about why you enjoy Audible as a service before now, and it's one that I continue to enjoy. 
Remember, if you're new to all of this, you can get involved today by starting your 30-day Audible trial with Premium Plus. This gets you a free audiobook as well as full access to thousands of originals, audiobooks and podcasts. You'll also get access to the Plus catalogue, all are included with your membership, so you can download and stream all you want, no credits needed. Visit audible.com slash Lutin, or for those in the US, text Lutin to 500-500. And as always, very big thanks to all of you for supporting me here on the channel. So as always, I'll see you in the next one.